June the 24th, 1982. British Airways Flight 9 cruises through the sky over Indonesia. In a few hours, the plane and all 263 people on board are scheduled to land in Perth, Australia. Phyllis Welch and her daughter are seated in cabin E at the very back of the enormous jet. How's that heroine of yours, Fanny Price, faring? Oh, she's having a tough old time at Mansfield Park. <laughs> it's a good place for me to spend a few hours. I wouldn't mind being there myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, Mum, we'll get there. We had already traversed at least two time zones. We were very tired. We had flown through Bombay, through Kuala Lumpur, hadn't been able to get much sleep, if any, and it was a dark, dark, pitch black night. Ahead of Betty and Phyllis, Charles Capewell is returning home to Perth, Australia, with his two boys, Chaz and Stephen. Right, settle down, lads. Come on. It's time for a nap. Get back to your seat. Oh. What, do you want to sleep here? All right. It was a good flight. It was going well. Uh, leaving London, it was great. And uh, we was all eager to go home, and the two boys were eager to get back to, to Mum. I thought, well, if we'd be home in three hours, Perth, they'll be Pat and we'll get in a taxi and we'll be home. While many of the passengers have been travelling for almost a day, the crew is fresh. They took control at the last stopover in Kuala Lumpur. Captain Eric Moody got his first taste of flying at the age of 16 when he took a gliding lesson. He was one of the first ever trained on the 747. Roger, check with Jakarta. Jakarta Control, Speedbird 9 over Halim at level 370. Speedbird 9, Roger. First Officer Roger Greaves has been a co-pilot for more than six years. Barry Townley Freeman has been a flight engineer on these aircraft for just a little longer. I'd not flown with Eric before, uh, or Barry. Uh, that was the first time we'd actually, we'd actually met on that, uh, that flight. As the jet flies over the city of Jakarta, it's cruising at more than 11,000 meters and has been in the air for an hour and a half. Captain Moody checks his weather radar. It shows smooth sailing for the next 500 kilometers. All right, Roger, it's all clear. Just keep your eyes open. I'll be back in a moment. Just got to use a loop. Back in the cabin, many of the passengers have fallen asleep. While Charles Capewell and his sons doze, an ominous haze appears above their heads. It's still legal to smoke on passenger jets in 1982. For the cabin crew, though, the smoke seems thicker than normal. Seems to be a lot of smoke out there. They begin to worry that a small fire may be smoldering somewhere on the plane. Maybe someone let up in the toilet. Let's go see if we can find it. A fire at 11,000 meters is a terrifying prospect. If there is a blaze somewhere, the crew must find it immediately. In the cockpit, the flight takes an unsettling turn. Barry and I were just sitting there minding the shop. Pitch dark night, of course. And then we started to get these pinpricks of light on the, on the windscreen. See, no moves fire. I don't think so. St. Elmo's fire is a natural phenomenon that's sometimes seen when planes fly through highly charged thunderclouds. But there aren't supposed to be any thunderclouds tonight. Anything on the radar? No. No, it's clear. I don't like the look of this. Let's get a better look out there. With the help of their landing lights, the two men are disturbed to see a thin layer of cloud surrounding their plane, even though nothing is showing up on their radar. But at 37,000 feet, the normal thing you would anticipate would be high cirrus, which is just a thin layer of cloud. I 
Think we better get the captain back up here. I was reading in my book, and there was a slight flick of turbulence, just a slight flick. And I glanced over to the left, where I had a clear view of the port wing. And to my surprise, it was covered in a, a brilliant white shimmering light, which seemed to be clinging to the wing of the aircraft. I carried on reading, but I found that I kept reading the same paragraph over and over again and not taking in a word of it. I, I just didn't know what was happening. In the cabin, the smoke begins to thicken. Stewards have been unable to figure out where it's coming from. If there's a fire, they can't find it. Eh? All right, well, go see that the passengers are comfortable. anything odd, Mum? Seems rather smoky in here. I noticed that thick smoke was pouring into the cabin through the vents above the windows. And that was a very sobering sight. Turkish cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> It smelt like a sort of a sulfuric electrical smell. And I went on that flight deck expecting to hear that we had some electrical smoke somewhere on the aircraft. But uh, nothing was further from the truth. When did it start? Well, just after you stepped out. Anything on radar? No, it's clear, not a cloud. Oh, my lord, look at engine four. It's lit up somehow. Captain, Captain, have a look at number one. It's the same on my side. None of the crew have ever seen anything like this before, but the light show is just the beginning. Their bizarre flight is about to take a terrifying turn for the worse. Strange lights are striking the windshield of a British Airways passenger jet heading to Perth, Australia. At the same time, the plane's engines are lit by a brilliant white glow. Look at engine four. It's lit up somehow. This uh, light show, if you like, had become more intense. In fact, we ended up sitting there with, with two sheets of brilliant white light in front of us in place of the windscreens. Inside the cabin, smoke has been growing thicker. Chief Steward Graham Skinner has been organising an intense but quiet search for fire. What's with all the smoke? There was smoke in the cabin. It got really, really hot. You were perspiring, literally drenched in perspiration. Um, the, the acrid smoke was at the back of your throat, up your nose, in your eyes, and you were rubbing this and your eyes were running, and it was, oh, it was a, not, not a very nice situation at all. Flight engineer Barry Townley Freeman has been checking his instruments carefully. He's smelled the smoke, but so far has no indication that there's a fire in any of the plane's systems. I can't find anything. With one mystery confronting them, they're suddenly faced with a frightening new situation. Dad! The engine's on fire! The whole of the, the wing was a sheet of light. And I thought, well, well I said, oh, well, you better close that because uh, we don't know what's that. Cheers. Sit down. Close the Then I realised that, you know, something was dramatically wrong. 
There were huge flames coming out of the back of the engines. 20, some people said 40 feet long. These huge jets of sheer flame shooting out of the back of, of all the engines. Is it going to penetrate from the outside of the aircraft? Is it going to come into the cabin? Are we going to burn to death? Are we going to choke to death on the smoke? What's going to happen? What's causing it? What are they going to do about it? As fire engulfs the engines, one of them revs loudly and flames out. Engine failure, number four. Fire action, number four. Checklist power and gear, set. Thrust lever, closed. Start lever, off. Once one engine fails, you call for the drill to shut that one down. You have drills for certain things so that you don't have, uh, you don't fly together as a crew forever. Uh, you can fly with different people then and you can standardise the operations. The instruments do not indicate a fire on the plane, but the passengers can see flames erupting from the engines and stretching down the length of the 747. I could not see the engines from where I was sitting. I could only see the space behind them but there was enough glow in that space to convince me that the aircraft was really seriously on fire. We were in trouble. They knew, that, as long as they were, they, they knew we were in bad, bad trouble. And they sort of uh, just looked at me as if to say, well, what are we doing now, Dad? If anything's gonna happen, I wanna be close to you. Oh, please. The cabin crew begins storing anything that's loose. They don't want dishes or bottles flying around the cabin if the plane begins to dive. Don't worry, just friction. If, if I was misleading them, then that, that was for a reason, because I didn't want to get up, uh, as upset as I felt. I just couldn't believe it. And, you know, and oh, this is going through my mind, and yet I'm chatting to the passengers and chatting to the crew, saying, oh, yeah, nothing to worry about. Yeah, it's just a little hiccup, you know. <laughs> so that was it. The 747 is more than 10 kilometres above the ocean. Its engines appear to be burning, and peculiar smoke continues to fill the cabin. And then the unthinkable happens. Number two, engine's gone. All right, then, begin the engine shut down. No, wait! We've all got... All four engines have failed. The other three just went out almost immediately, and that's when it begins to be a serious emergency. Those engines made a grating, rumbling sound, almost like a cement mixer. And then, gradually, the, the noise just disappeared and they became silent. A minute and a half, we'd gone from four engines running normally to having none. The 747 has plenty of fuel, yet somehow all four of the jet's engines have completely stopped working. Roger, declare emergency. Mayday, 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 Speedbird 9. We have lost all four engines out of 370. Mayday, 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 Speedbird 9. We have lost all four engines. With no engine power and no idea what has crippled their plane, British Airways Flight 9 begins falling from the sky. Jakarta Control, Speedbird 9. We have lost all four engines. Now out of 360. First Officer Roger Greaves issues a mayday, but he has trouble getting his message across. Jakarta Control, Speedbird 9. We have lost all four engines. Repeat, all four engines. Now descending through flight level 350. Speedbird 9, you have lost number four engine. This idiot doesn't understand. Jakarta Control, Speedbird 9. We have lost all four engines. Repeat, all four engines. Now descending through flight level 350. The, the air traffic control at Jakarta, unfortunately, seemed to have a slight problem in understanding what we actually were saying. Only when another plane nearby relays the Mayday call do controllers in Jakarta understand. Now descending through flight level 350. 
Speedbird 9, all four engines out. Understood. As far as the crew knows, no 747 had ever lost power to all of its engines before. The crew has to find out why it's happening now. I think we've cocked something up. We were concerned and worried that we'd done something wrong, you know, to cause the whole thing. All three of us felt exactly the same. And, and it, was, it was a personal guilt in the sense of, what have I missed? What have I done wrong? You know, because, you know, this kind of thing doesn't happen. While not built for gliding, even without its engines, a 747 can travel forward 15 kilometers for every kilometer it drops. With no power, Flight 9 has started a long, slow fall. Some 10 kilometers above the ocean, the crew has less than half an hour before they smash into the sea. When they all stop, you go into automatic mode, obviously. We had practiced this drill on the simulator many, many times. And that's very good and, and all very well, as long as when it happens to you for real, what happens on the aeroplane is mirrored by what happens to you in the simulator. And I'm afraid that wasn't so. In the simulator, when all four engines stop, the autopilot turns off. But high above the Indian Ocean, Captain Moody sees that his autopilot is still on. We were all three confused and, and concerned that what was happening to us um, wasn't what we'd been told would happen to us. All right, begin restart drill. Set. In the heat of the situation, they have no time to figure out why the autopilot is still on. On? Anything? Anything? No. Again. All right, then, from the top, battery, check. On. Crossfeed valves, open. Fire switch, in. The standard restart drill takes up to three minutes to complete. Plunging from the sky, the crew has fewer than 10 chances to get their engines going before they run out of time. Never on. Come on. Again, gentlemen. All right, from the top, battery, check. On. Crossfeed valves. Open. Fire switch. In. At 10,000 meters, Captain Eric Moody decides to turn the plane back toward the closest airport, Halim, just outside Jakarta. But even that is too far away if he can't get at least some of the engines going again. Jakarta, Speedbird 9, turning left back to Halim out of 300. Zero, zero. Speedbird 9, radar cannot see you. Squawk Alpha 7700. Air traffic control asks them to transmit the emergency transponder signal. Jakarta, Speedbird 9, we are already squawking 7700. Zero, zero. Now the crew is flying back to an airport that can't find them on radar. Without the constant rumble of the engines, the cabin is quiet. Some of the passengers feel the plane beginning to descend. But without communication from the cockpit, they can only guess. The quietness was unbelievable, because it was sort of... The aeroplane was no engines, nothing, and it, it seemed to be eerie, you know, a bit surreal, really, because like as if he was in suspended in space or something. And all he could feel was this quietness and the whimpering from a few people that were really upset. Some people were sitting quite rigidly, almost as if they hadn't noticed anything. At first it was, it was sheer fear, and then after a while it turns to Acceptance, you know you're going to die. We knew we were going to die. What's going on? What's the problem? It's just a technical fault. I've been through much worse, let me tell you. Everything be fine. I think if I'd have sat down and really thought of exactly what was happening, I don't think I would have ever got up again. One steward came up to us and said, are you two ladies all right? And yes, we said, we're fine, which was an absolute lie, but that's how it was. It seemed absolutely vital not to panic. Captain Moody can't restart the engines unless he can keep the plane flying between 250 and 270 knots. But the airspeed indicators aren't working. Captain, I've got 320 knots on my side. Well, I've got 270. Well, bloody hell, that's a 50-knot difference. 
I'll change the speed. Falling from the sky with no engine power, the crew now have no idea how fast they're going. But to have the best chance to restart the engines, Captain Moody has to have the plane flying at the right speed. So from that point onwards, Eric then varied the speed through, um, through um, a, a, just about 100 knot range, hoping that at some point or other, coincidental with us putting the fuel into the engines, that we would actually be at the right speed. To change speeds, Captain Moody turns the autopilot off. Then he slowly pulls the nose of the jet up to slow it, and then pushes it down to increase his speed. The upsetting roller coaster movement adds to the panic felt in the cabin. At one time, the aircraft developed a strange motion. It seemed to be climbing steeply and then diving down. That was the sensation we got, and the bucking action that was so violent that we felt it could break the aircraft up in the air. Pressure warning, Captain. We're at 10,000. Pressure warning? That's, that's not supposed to do that. And a warning horn went off. Now, this didn't have ever happen on the simulator in this exercise, so it was a bit of a surprise to us. As well as providing electrical power, the engines on a jumbo jet help keep the cabin pressurized. <laughs> With the engines not working, of course, the air wasn't being pumped in. So gradually, the pressure was leaking away. With all four engines gone, the pressurized air is rapidly seeping out. The thinning level of oxygen makes passengers gasp. <laughs> the crew reach for their oxygen masks. But First Officer Greaves can't get his mask to work. My oxygen mask, yeah, that was a problem I could have done without. It was stowed above my head. And when I pulled the oxygen mask down, the mask and the tube became separated. The captain must make a difficult choice. If he continues to descend slowly, it will get increasingly difficult for First Officer Greaves to breathe. I said, look, if we get down to 20,000 feet um, quickly, we can all take our oxygen masks off and we can talk and we're back as a crew again. We had to actually increase the rate of descent to descend to a lower altitude quicker which in the circumstances was something that we wouldn't really have chosen to, to do. So then I dived the aeroplane and got rid of about 6,000 feet in a minute. The loss of cabin pressure and the steep dive have another terrifying consequence. <laughs> the things shot down, they sort of dangled down in front of you. And I looked to see if Stephen had got ears and Chaz had pulled his out of the socket. So I made sure that Chaz got his oxygen. I've seen a few movies on uh, planes and, you know, once that happens, you know you're in serious trouble. The oxygen masks came down and we put those to our faces, as, as had been described in the drill, which fortunately we had been observing at the beginning of the flight. But it seemed that the, the oxygen supply was not working. <laughs> the cabin crew try to use the public address system to explain what's going on, but it's not working. Chief Steward Graham Skinner makes do with a low-tech backup. <laughs> We're having a small problem with the public address system. So if you would, place your mask over your mouth and nose and breathe normally. As the passengers struggle with their masks, Captain Eric Moody is running out of options. If his engines don't start soon, he'll have to turn his jet around and try landing on the open ocean. High above the Indian Ocean, the seemingly impossible has occurred. All four engines on a British Airways 747 have stopped working, and the crew has no idea why. First Officer Roger Greaves manages to fix his broken oxygen mask, but he's still frustrated by engines that won't start. 
All right, Barry, let's start the restart drill. Ready, set, battery, check, on. Standby power, on. Anything? Come on, anything. No. All right, then, let's do it from the top. Battery, check, on. First Officer Greaves and Engineer Barry Townley Freeman have actually shortened the standard restart drill. It's giving them more chances to get the engines going. But so far, nothing's working. Come on, you old son. The process that we were going through the whole time was just continuous. Uh, we, we hadn't had any success with the drill at all, um, despite all the efforts we were putting in. But it was, it was the only thing we had left to cling on to, so that's what we did. From the top again, battery, check, on. I have no idea, and I don't think any of us have, how many times we tried to restart those engines. If I say 20, I would think that's too low. If I say 50, I would think that's probably about right. As the plane falls lower and lower, Captain Moody faces a brutal choice. A mountain range cuts across the island of Java between his plane and the airport. He knows he has to be at least 3,500 meters high to clear it. But if his engines don't restart soon, they won't make it. At this rate, it will crash in a matter of minutes. It's just a question of where. Captain Moody decides if the engines don't restart soon, he'll turn back towards the ocean and try landing on the water. All right, are we getting something? It's not starting. I knew it was so difficult to land aeroplanes on the sea, even when you had everything going for you. Uh, and I thought that, uh, well, we haven't got much going for us here. I'd never done it before. Hiding his concern, Captain Moody addresses the passengers and crew. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We have a small problem. All four engines have stopped. We're doing our damnedest to get it under control. I trust you are not in too much distress. <laughs> Most of the passengers expect the worst. Ma, in trouble. Plane going down. We'll do best for the boys. We love you. Sorry, Pa. I thought we were going down, heading for the ocean, which crash. And I thought if she got the note, um, you know, she knew we were still thinking about it. And we did whatever we could. Will we be burnt alive? Will we be choked by the smoke? Will the aircraft break up in the air and hurtle us out into space? Which was my biggest fear. Or will we come down in the sea and be eaten by sharks alive? Or will we crash into a mountain? Let's crash into a mountain quickly and get all this over. Well, nothing. It's not starting. All right, from the top then, battery, check, on. Down by power, on. Finally, Captain Moody has to decide. Carry on and likely crash into the mountains, or turn around and ditch into the sea. I don't know how to swim. I couldn't swim anyway, so I thought, well, you know, I'm doomed anyway. And I, I just hoped that maybe one of the passengers might uh, help the two boys to make sure that they could stay afloat. Well, anything? No. All right, then, from the top again, battery. We had very few uh, chances left of starting the engines before having to turn out to, to sea again, because we wouldn't have been able to clear the, the mountains on the south coast of Java. Cut off! Fuel pressure! Now available! Standby ignition on! And then, as suddenly as it had stopped working, the fourth engine roars back to life. Engine four, back online! Then all of a sudden there was this sort of like somebody giving the, the aeroplane a punch from underneath. And then I realised that there might have been an engine and it was a boom. 
Oh, oh my God, no. The noise that a Rolls Royce engine makes when it starts up is low rumbling noise, you know, and it was, uh, it, it was just, well, it was wonderful to hear it. A 747 can fly with one engine, but Captain Moody knows that just one engine still won't give him enough power to clear the mountains. The glass now is half full, it's not half empty. We're now in with a, a real chance, and I'll tell you what, the three of us would have dragged that aeroplane round the whole island of Java. As the plane falls past 4,000 metres, another engine coughs and comes back to life. Engine three, back online! It's followed quickly by the final two. I can't believe it. Engines one and two, both back online. <laughs> From almost certain disaster, the crippled jet is now under full power. Oh my God, my God. I realised then that we could make it back to, not to Perth, but to, to, to an airport. That's all we wanted was to land on, on, on the earth and, and, you know, be part of the living again. Because while we were up there, we were dead. Jakarta, Speedbird 9, we are back in business. All four running, all four This running. time, local controllers have no trouble understanding the message. All four engines serviceable again. Confirm continuing to Halley. Affirmative. Affirmative. <laughs> we say, right, let's get this thing on the ground as quickly as we can. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We seem to have overcome that problem and have managed to start all the engines. <laughs> <laughs> We are diverting to Jakarta and expect to land in about 15 minutes. <laughs> Captain Moody begins climbing, putting plenty of room between his plane and the mountains below. But as he does, the strange lights that he saw when the crisis began reappear in front of the jet. Now, as soon as we got to 15,000 feet, this St. Elmo's fire started again. I'm not slow, so I said, let's get out of here quickly. But before he can descend very far, the plane is stricken again. Engine two is surging. <laughs> the whole aeroplane was shaking. It was just going bang, bang, bang. The atmosphere in the cabin was very tense and very quiet. By then, I think very few people were talking. I think there were quite a lot of prayers going up. The engines backfire violently. The captain must make another fateful decision. Begin shutdown drill. Checklist powering gear. Off. Thrust lever. Closed. We, we were reluctant to do it, as you can probably understand, but, you know, that was it. So we were back on three engines. Now, I'm not a coward, but when you've had four engines going, no engines going, you get four going and tell me, show me any pilot that will quickly shut down that engine, because you're worried that they're all going to stop again. Jakarta, Speedbird 9, leaving 154-120. We are now on three engines. As the plane closes in on the airport, First Officer Greaves thinks the windshield is covered in moisture, making it hard to see through. And I said, I said to Eric, I said, it's a bit misty out there. So we turn, turn the blowers on to kind of, you know, like demisters on your car to try and, and uh, clear that. That didn't work. I used the windscreen wipers and that didn't work. Somehow the glass itself has been badly damaged. For some unknown reason, I looked out the edge of my windscreen and about a two-inch strip down the edge on the left-hand side, I could see much more clearly, but I couldn't see anything much out the front. It, it was getting more and more opaque the nearer and nearer we got to the lights. The crew get a final unwelcome surprise. Equipment on the ground that helps them descend at the proper angle isn't working. Jakarta ADC, be advised our glide path is unserviceable. The localizer, which gives you the left and right of the runway center line, that was working, but the glide slope, which gives you the actual profile for the descent, was not working. After all the troubles they've been through, now the crew has to land their plane manually. We then continued with Eric flying the localizer and me calling out the distance and the altitude that he should be at. 
300 feet, Captain. So he was then able to adjust his rate of descent to what I was telling him as far as the glide cert was concerned. 200. 150 feet, Captain. One hundred. Fifty feet. Thirty feet. just landed itself, uh, it, it seemed to anyway, it kissed the earth. It was beautiful. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> Safely on the ground at Halim Airport in Jakarta, passengers celebrate the end of a harrowing ordeal. They also want to know what happened. No fire had been found, so why had smoke filled the cabin? How could all four engines have stopped at nearly the same time? What were the strange lights that surrounded the plane? In the cockpit, the flight crew are relieved, but also concerned that they might be at fault. The first thing that we did, having parked the aeroplane and shut it all down, um, was to then go through all the paperwork to see if there was possibly anything anywhere in it that might have given us any pre-warning of some sort of phenomenon that caused what happened to us. Every time, because it's going it's to come back to us. The damage to the 747 is extensive. From the outside, the crew realized that their windshield had been deeply scratched. They see bare metal showing through where the paint has somehow been stripped away and they still have no idea why any of it happened. When investigators uncover the cause of the disaster, Flight 9 changes pilot training around the world. During a calm flight to Australia, all four engines of a British Airways 747 suddenly stopped working. <laughs> After a long, terrifying descent, the crew managed to restart the engines and land. Wow, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> They spent an excited and largely sleepless night in Jakarta before returning to Halim Airport to inspect their plane. And we went back the next day to look at it in daylight. The aeroplane had lost its sheen, and in some places it had been sandblasted quite well, uh, and all the decals and, and the paint had come off. It really was very little to see until they stripped the engines down. The engines were manufactured by Rolls-Royce, their investigation was led by a former engineer, Malcolm Greyburn. Three of the engines were removed in Jakarta uh, following the incident and were ferried back via cargo aircraft to London Heathrow and then transported to South Wales, where the engines were, in fact, stripped down into piece parts. And it was there that I got involved. Greyburn was stunned by what he saw. Much of the engine was badly scratched and scored. We did do a forensic analysis of the engines, and we did record it all in terms of photographic analysis, and also we did a lot of laboratory analysis. Greyburn discovered the engines were choked with fine dust, pieces of rock and sand. When it was closely studied, they learned that the debris was clearly volcanic ash. 
Days after their harrowing flight, the passengers and crew learned that the night they were flying, there had been a major eruption of the Mount Galangung volcano, located just 160 kilometers southeast of Jakarta. Tom Casadeval is director of the U.S. Geological Survey and has studied the Galangung volcano. Indonesia is the world's most volcanically active country. It has more than 130 historically active volcanoes, meaning volcanoes which have erupted in the last several thousand years. Galangung erupted explosively early in the 1980s. In April, May, June of 1982, the eruptions became increasingly more powerful. The eruptions were large and the damage was extensive. More than 60,000 people were evacuated from the area around the mountain. The night Flight 9 flew nearby, the volcano erupted again. As the ash cloud rose more than 15,000 meters into the night, winds pushed it to the southwest, right into the path of British Airways Flight 9. Never before had a volcanic cloud seriously affected an airplane. Could the ash really have crippled this flight? Roger, declare emergency. Mayday, 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 Speedbird 9. We have lost all four engines. Unlike ash that you might see in a chimney or after a fire in a forest, this is not soft material at all. This is very fine ground up particles of solid rock and minerals. This material is very, very abrasive. It's very angular in shape. If you were to see it under a microscope, you would see very sharp angles. And so that's what caused the abrasion. In addition to sandblasting the windshield and all the leading edges of the plane, could the ash cloud explain all the other strange phenomena the passengers and crew had experienced? Remember, the aircraft is moving in close to 500 miles per hour as it's flying into that cloud. Even though it's a very fine material, it can still cause abrasion and friction on the skin of the aircraft. Because it's such a dry environment up there, that frictional electrification produces the glow that we refer to as St. Elmo's fire. The electrification also caused the interference in communication experienced by the crew. Speedbird 9, you have lost number 4 engine. Some of the volcanic ash that was sucked in and ground up by the engines was also blown into the plane. And when passengers and crew saw it swirling through the cabin, they feared the worst. You're a passenger, you're looking out the window, suddenly you start breathing this sulfurous, sulfur-laden air in the cabin, and it probably is a choking, probably a shocking uh, sensation. It's essentially a, a house of horrors type situation. While the volcanic ash caused the visible scarring, filled the plane with smoke and fouled communications, could it cause the engines to flame out as well? An X-ray from front to back. Of the a turbofan jet engine works by sucking in enormous amounts of air. The air is then highly pressurized by the engine's compressor. This tightly packed air is mixed with fuel and ignited. The force of this reaction propels the jet through the sky. The temperature in the combustion chamber where this ash is flowing through are around 2,000 degrees centigrade. And so the volcanic ash we know melts at about 1,300, 1,400 degrees. But when the liquid ash reached deeper into the engine, it cooled slightly, turning into a sticky molten goo. It attached itself to the engine and began choking it. we got a fundamental disturbance of the airflow in the main core of the engine, which caused the engine to backfire. And the engines flamed out, and that was the cause of the problem. Backfires occur when the engine isn't burning cleanly. The engine's on fire! There's too much fuel and not enough oxygen. 
Engine failure. Number four. Fire action, number four. Checklist, power and gear. On Set. flight nine, the backfires were the cause of the enormous jets of flame many passengers saw behind the engines. After struggling against the choking effects of the ash cloud, the engines on board the 747 flamed out. What Greyburn found next was that a remarkable piece of chemistry saved the plane. As soon as you came out of the volcanic ash and the engines were not running, remember, so everything cooled down, it was enough for this stuff to break off and allow the engines to restart. When enough of the molten ash was gone, the engines were clear again and Townley Freeman's frantic efforts to restart them paid off. Engine four, back online. We have learned quite a bit, and we've incorporated this learning into pilot training. Pilots now, for example, know what signs to look for when they might be in an ash cloud, and those signs include the odor of sulfur in the cabin, dust accumulating in the cabin, and if you're at night, you might look out and see the frictional electrification or the St. Elmo's fire on the leading edges of the aircraft. Another important lesson learned from Flight 9 is that volcanic ash clouds do not appear on normal weather radar, which reflects water. Since the clouds are dry, they're all but invisible to radar. That knowledge has led to better communications between the geologists that study volcanoes and the international airlines that fly over them. The crew of Flight 9 was showered with awards and commendations in the months after their incredible night. I thought the airmanship displayed by this crew during this event was absolutely fantastic. The way that they managed to guide this aircraft back down to a safe landing after having been through such extreme circumstances, it was fantastic the way they recovered this aircraft. Absolutely brilliant. For everyone on board Flight 9, the terrifying plunge through the skies had a lasting impact. Betty Tutel was so struck by the events of that night that she wrote a book about the ordeal. This was an event which was unique in aviation history. And it seemed to me absolutely vital that it should be put on record. And I wondered who was going to do this. But no sooner had that thought entered my mind than I thought, I'm going to do that. Tutel would also end up marrying a man she met on the flight, James Ferguson. Charles Capewell and his two sons made it home two days after they touched down in Jakarta. 25 years later, both Chaz and Stephen still live in Perth. Our time hadn't came and that was it. From then on, I took a different view of life. When your time comes, there's nothing you can do, but you can still hope. And we out, and we got out of it. Not long after their fateful flight, Captain Eric Moody created the Gallangung Gliding Club. Every member of the crew and all passengers were automatically admitted to this exclusive group. The survivors of British Airways Flight 9 happily stay in touch to this day.